Bantam Audio Publishing presents a double-day production of Prelude to Foundation by Isaac Asimov. Cleon I, according to the Encyclopedia Galactica, was the last galactic emperor of the Intun dynasty, born in the year 11,988 of the Galactic Era, the same year in which the psycho-historian Harry Seldon was born. It is thought that Harry Seldon's birth date, which some consider doubtful, may have been adjusted to match that of Cleon, whom Seldon, soon after his arrival on Trantor, is supposed to have encountered. Having succeeded to the imperial throne in 12,010 at the age of 22, Cleon I reigned during a curious interval of quiet in those troubled times. This is undoubtedly due to the skills of his chief of staff, Ito de Merzel, who so carefully obscured himself from public record that little is known about him. Suppressing a small yawn, Cleon said, De Merzel, have you by any chance ever heard of a man named Harry Seldon? Harry Seldon, said de Merzel. It is an unfamiliar name to me, sire. Ought I to know of him? The Minister of Science mentioned him to me last night, said Cleon. He said that this Harry Seldon had attended a convention of mathematicians held here in Trantor, and that Seldon had proved that one could foretell the future mathematically. De Merzel permitted himself a small smile. Surely foretelling the future is a children's dream of magic. Is it, de Merzel? People believe in such things. If a mathematician should predict a long and happy reign for me, would that not be well? Many a prophecy, by mere force of its being believed, has been transmuted to fact, self-fulfilling prophecies. Now that I think of it, de Merzel, it was you who once explained this to me. I believe I did, sire. Still, if that be so, one could have any person make the prophecy. His eyes were watching the emperor carefully as though to see how far he might go on his own. Not all persons would be believed equally, said Cleon. A mathematician, however, who could back his prophecy with his formulas, might be understood by no one, yet believed by everyone. As usual, sire, said the chief of staff, you make good sense. De Merzel, you tell me you have your string stretching to every part of this turbulent world, even where my forces dare not go. Pull on one of those strings, then, and bring in this mathematician. Let me see him. I will do so, sire, said de Merzel, who had already located Selden. He made a mental note to commend the Minister of Science for a job well done. Harry Selden did not make an impressive appearance at this time. Like the Emperor, he was thirty-two years old. His face was smooth and cheerful, his hair dark brown, almost black, but he was small in stature, and his clothing had the unmistakable touch of provinciality about it. To anyone in later times who knew of Harry Seldon only as a legendary demigod, it would seem almost sacrilegious for him not to have white hair, not to be seated in a wheelchair. Even then, in advanced old age, his eyes had been cheerful, however. And Selden's eyes were particularly cheerful now, for his paper had been given at the decennial convention. It had even aroused some interest. And now, a new development, he was in an official ground car en route to the palace with an officer of the Emperor's guards. They were in one of the wealthiest sections of Trantor. The dome was high enough here to give a sensation of being in the open and in sunlight. And then the dome curved down and the walls narrowed in, and soon they were moving along an enclosed tunnel. A door opened and the ground car sped through. When the door closed behind them, they were in the open, the true, real open. Here were 250 square kilometers of the only real open land on Trantor, and on it stood the Imperial Palace. And yet, in passing into the open patch of wood and parkland, Harry Seldon had passed into a world in which clouds dimmed the sky and a chill wind ruffled his shirt. It was dismal outside. Oh. 
Selden was not at all sure he would meet the Emperor. After all, how many people ever did see him, in person, rather than on Holovision? The number was vanishingly small. So it was that when Selden was ushered into a lavishly furnished room and found a young-looking man sitting on the edge of a table in a windowed alcove, one foot on the ground and one foot swinging over the edge, he wondered that an official should be looking at him in so blandly good-natured a way. "'You are Harry Selden, I believe,' said the official." As they began to converse, Selden suddenly realized that he was speaking to the Emperor Cleon, and he felt the wind go out of him. "'Your talk attracted some attention,' Cleon said. "'I am given to understand that you believe it is possible to predict the future.' "'Not exactly,' Selden explained. "'Anything as complicated as human society quickly becomes chaotic and therefore unpredictable.' What I have done is to show that it is possible to predict the future in broad sweeps, not with certainty, but with calculable probabilities. I, I've merely shown that a mathematical analysis is possible. I have not shown it to be practical. How can something be possible yet not practical? Cleon asked. Consider, said Selden, twenty-five million worlds each with its overall characteristics and culture, each containing a billion or more human beings who each has an individual mind, and all the worlds interacting in innumerable ways and combinations. However theoretically possible a psychohistorical analysis may be, is not likely that it can be done in any practical sense. What do you mean, psychohistorical? the emperor asked. Selden answered, I refer to the theoretical assessment of probabilities concerning the future as psychohistory. The emperor rose to his feet suddenly. Stand up, he commanded. Selden rose and looked up at the somewhat taller emperor. He strove to keep his gaze steady. Finally, Cleon said, This psychohistory of yours, if it could be made practical, it would be of great use, would it not? Of enormous use, obviously, Selden answered. It was only a mathematical demonstration. Public knowledge of psychohistory would make valid predictions impossible. But, of course, that doesn't invalidate it as a mathematical theory. I find that disgusting, said Cleon. Selden shrugged slightly. More than ever, he knew he should never have given the paper. What would become of him if the emperor took it into his head that he had been made to play the fool? Nevertheless, said Cleon, what if you were to make predictions of the future, mathematically justified or not, predictions that government officials will judge to be the kind that will bring about useful reactions? But I wouldn't do so, said Selden. Cleon watched him out of narrow eyes. Selden felt trapped. If given a direct order by the emperor, would it be safe to refuse? If he refused, he might be imprisoned or executed. He said finally, it wouldn't work. To attain results, I would have to predict immediate eventualities. Sooner or later, probably sooner, one would not come to pass, and my usefulness would be ended at once. Cleon threw himself into a chair and frowned at Selden. You are useless to me, Selden, and so is your psychohistory. Leave me. Selden apologized and tried to bow, but at some signal he did not see... Two guards entered and took him away. Ito de Merzel emerged and glanced at the emperor with a hint of proper deference. Sire, you have almost lost your temper. Cleon looked up and with obvious effort managed to smile. Well, so I did. The man was very disappointing. More than disappointing, said de Merzel. He can do much harm without intending it. He does not know his own strength, sire, or his importance. Cleon looked thoughtfully discontented. Why should you consider him dangerous? He seems a naive provincial to me. There is this mathematical theory of his, de Merzel replied. He may yet work out some way of making use of it, sire. To foretell the future, however mistily, is to be in a position of great power, even if he does not wish power for himself. He might be used by others. I tried to use him, said Cleon. He would not allow it. He had not given it thought, said de Merzel. Perhaps now he will. 
and if he was not interested in being used by you, might he not be persuaded by, let us say, the mayor of Y sector? Cleon scowled. Do you really think he might develop this psycho-history of his? Perhaps I ought to have kept him. Demerzel said, No, sire, your instinct was correct. Imprisonment, however disguised, would cause resentment and despair. Better to have let him go, but to keep him forever on an invisible leash. And when he has fully developed his science, we can pull on our leash and bring him in. Then we could be more persuasive. Chetter Humman, according to the Encyclopedia Galactica, was a Trantorian journalist of some note. His use of inside connections and his keen political insights won Humman early recognition as a newsman. He is remembered chiefly for his brief but sympathetic friendship with Harry Seldon. Seldon had had an evening, a night, and part of a morning to get over his meeting with the Emperor. He sat now in a small park, on a small plastic seat that molded itself neatly to his body, and he was comfortable. He had only this one day to enjoy. He would leave tomorrow for Helicon, and he might, after all, never return to Trantor. Still, he continued to feel uneasy at having spoken as independently as he had to a man who could at will order one's death. It was not good to have attracted the Emperor's attention. Selden looked up at the bright, diffuse light. A fountain played not far from him. The plants were green. There were a few other persons taking advantage of the park. A man walked past, looked at Selden briefly, then sat down on a seat facing him and buried himself in a sheaf of teleprints. Selden watched the man, rather unobtrusively, for he seemed to be engaged in some sort of internal debate. He was tall, with broad shoulders, and darkish hair with a glint of blonde. His face had a grave expression, and was a touch rugged. By the time the man had lost the internal fight with himself, or won, perhaps, and leaned toward him, Selden had decided he liked him. Harry Selden, the mathematician from Helicon, said the man. I'm Cheddar Humman. I'm a journalist. I supply material for the news holocausts. I recognize you from covering the convention. They began an agreeable conversation. Then Humman said, I've heard you were seen in the company of an imperial guard, making for the palace gate. You weren't by any chance seen by the emperor, were you? The smile vanished from Selden's face. Why do you ask? Private curiosity, answered the journalist. Let me guess, I didn't follow your paper, but I gathered you were talking about the possibility of predicting the future. Selden shook his head and muttered, It was a mistake. Humman shrugged slightly. Ito de Merzel was there at the palace, I suppose. You know, Cleon's alter ego, Cleon's brain, Cleon's evil spirit. He's been called all those things. He must have been there. Selden looked confused, and Humman said, Well, you may not have seen him, but he was there. And if he thinks you can predict the future... I can't predict the future, said Selden. Just the same, said Humman. If he thinks you can, he will not let you go. And when he wants you, he'll get you, wherever you are. And if he decides you're useful, he'll squeeze the use out of you. And if he decides you're dangerous, he'll squeeze the life out of you. Selden stared. What are you trying to do? Frighten me? I'm trying to warn you, Humman said. A little while ago, you said something was a mistake. Were you thinking that presenting that paper was a mistake? and that it was getting you into all sorts of trouble? Selden bit his lower lip uneasily. That guess came entirely too close to the truth, and it was at this moment that he felt the presence of intruders. He looked up. Two young men, both large and strong, were looking down at him with expressions of amused contempt. They were dressed in an extreme of Trantorian fashion, boldly clashing colors, round hats with wide brims and bright, pink ribbons extending from the brim to the back of the neck. In Selden's eyes, it was humorous, and he smiled. The young man before him snapped, What are you grinning at, misfit? Selden ignored the manner of address and said, Please, pardon my smile. I was merely enjoying your costume. The young man's finger flicked at the lapel of Selden's jacket. So, and what are you wearing? 
Selden said, I'm afraid it's my outworld or clothes. Well, why did you go back there? The second man snarled. Selden couldn't help noticing that the others who were sitting in the small park were rising and walking off as though expecting trouble. The young men continued to taunt Selden until finally Hummond confronted them. Enraged, one man advanced on Selden. His hands came down sharply to seize Selden's lapels and jerk him upright. Selden pushed away and his chair tipped backwards. He seized the hand stretched towards him. Somehow the man streaked overhead, turning as he did so, and came down hard on his neck and back behind Selden. Selden twisted as his chair went down and was quickly on his feet, staring down at the man who lay unmoving, his face twisted in agony. He had two badly sprained thumbs and a backbone that had been sorely jarred. Hummond had grabbed the other man's neck from behind, and now he pulled his right arm backward at a vicious angle. The man labored uselessly for breath. A knife, glittering with a small laser inset, lay on the ground beside them. Hummond said an ordinary blade would do the job without requiring a power source. You two better get out of here, otherwise we'll have to give evidence against you for assault and attempted murder. This knife can surely be traced to you. The young men staggered away, still bent in pain. How can I thank you, Selden said to Hummond. The journalist only said, we better get out of here too. Some of those people who cleared out of the park might have alerted the police. Those two came to find you, specifically you. They were told you were wearing Heliconian clothes, and you must have been described precisely. I suspect they were sent by the people who control the police. So let's not wait any longer. He gripped Selden's upper arm and they hurried off. Selden found the grip impossible to shake. They plunged into an arcade. And before Selden even became accustomed to the dimmer light, they heard the burring sound of a ground car's brakes. There they are, muttered Hummond. Faster, Selden. They hopped onto a moving corridor and lost themselves in the crowd. Now they were in a small room in a pleasant apartment structure that might be anywhere for all that Selden could tell. Hummond had directed Selden to a communal washroom down the hall, and someone had entered before Selden was through. He had cast one brief and curious look at Selden's clothes, then looked away. Selden mentioned this to Hummond, who shook his head and said, We'll have to get rid of your clothes. Too bad Helicon is so far out of fashion. Selden felt suddenly angry. Come on, Hummond, I can't play this game any further. I'm finished here, and I, and I want to go home. Now listen to me, said Hummond. Helicon is good, safe, imperial territory where the Emperor's forces can count on the full cooperation of the local government. You would be under constant surveillance at all times. Any time Demersel wants you, he will be able to have you. And were I not warning you, you would have no knowledge of this. There is only one world, Selden, that is not really under the Emperor's control. That, I think, is what must be disturbing Demersel. Selden thought a while. What world is that? Amun said. You're on it. He went on. The Empire could not seriously exert force against Trantor. To do so would be bound to shake up some facet or other the technology on which the whole planet depends. That is the weakness at the Empire's core. Believe me, Selden, the Emperor knows, and Ito de Merzel knows, even if you don't, that to disturb Trantor may destroy the Empire. That's why he wanted to force you off Trantor. But I can take you to a place on Trantor where Demersel won't be able to touch you. Selden asked, But how long will I have to remain on Trantor? Hummond answered, For as long as your safety requires it. For the rest of your life, perhaps. They traveled along walkways where the light was soft and yellow. Hummond's eyes moved this way and that, ever watchful. He said, we're heading for a taxi rental where they know me as a journalist. I've done favors for them occasionally, and sometimes they do favors in return. At the air taxi terminal, Selden tried to look inconspicuous. Meanwhile, Hummond had presented the necessary credits and returned with the superconductive ceramic tile that would activate a specific air taxi. Get in, Selden, he said, gesturing to a small, two-seated vehicle. The air taxi found its way past and around the other ground cars and finally moved onto a smooth, upward-slanting track and gained speed. Then it lifted upward with a jolt. What appeared before them now looked like a cliff patterned with cave openings. Hummond maneuvered toward an opening, avoiding the other air taxis that were heading for other tunnels. They slid into the tunnel as if they'd been sucked in. Hummond released the controls and sat back. He drew a deep breath and said, well, that's one stage successfully carried through. 
We might have been stopped at the station. In here, we're fairly safe. Am I really going to be safe wherever it is you're taking me? asked Selden. Quite safe from any open movement on the part of the Imperial forces, said Hummond. Of course, when it comes to the individual operator, the spy, the agent, the hired assassin, one must always be careful. Naturally, I will supply you with a bodyguard. Selden felt uneasy. Hired assassin. Would they really want to kill me? I'm sure Demerzel doesn't, Hummond replied. I suspect he wants to use you rather than kill you. Still, other enemies may turn up. You can't go through life sleepwalking. Selden shook his head and turned his face away. Now it was finally sinking in. He was a wanted man, hunted by Imperial forces. But something else bothered him. He turned to Hummond and asked, Why should you take even the smallest risk for someone who's a stranger to you? Hummond checked the controls in a preoccupied manner, and then he faced Selden squarely, eyes steady and serious. I want to save you for the same reason that the Emperor wants to use you, for your predictive powers. Selden felt a deep pang of disappointment. He was merely the helpless and disputed prey of competing predators. I will never live down that presentation at the decennial convention. I've ruined my life. No. Don't rush to conclusions, mathematician. The Emperor and his officers want you only to make their own lives more secure. I, on the other hand, want your powers for the good of the galaxy. Is there a distinction? With the stern beginning of a frown, Hummond replied, Humanity is far older than the Empire. It may even be far older than the 25 million worlds of the galaxy. There are legends of a time when we inhabited a single world... Legends, said Selden, shrugging his shoulders. Yes, legends. But there must have been a time when people could not travel at superluminal velocities and were imprisoned in a single planetary system. And if we look forward in time, the human beings of the galaxy will surely continue to exist after you and the Emperor are dead. What of them? Could one know by this art of prediction that you speak of? Psychohistory is what I call it, Hummond. In theory, one could but it cannot be turned into a practical technique. Would you try, asked Hummond, if you knew the truth about humanity's situation? That's an impossible question, Selden replied. What is the truth about humanity's situation? Do you claim to know it? Hummond's eyes faced forward again, turning briefly toward the blank, changeless tunnel as it pushed toward them. Yes, I do, he said, and in five words. The Galactic Empire is dying. Harry Selden remained uncomfortably silent for a while. How could one say that the Galactic Empire was dying? It had existed for over ten thousand years. Trantor itself was called the Eternal World. Harry Selden decided to give voice to the question that nagged at him. He asked, Why do you say the Galactic Empire is dying? Hummond turned to him. He cited evidence of Trantor's decay the decreasing population, the stagnation of galactic trade, the slowing rate of technological advance, and a noticeable deterioration in equipment and goods. He stopped for a moment and appeared thoughtful. Of course, I might be wrong. I'm speaking only from intuition. What I need is a working technique of psychohistory. Selma did not take the bait. I don't have such a technique to give you. But suppose you're right. Suppose the Empire is running down and will eventually fall apart. The human species will still exist. I predict, said Hummond, that were the Empire to fall, universal war and anarchy would reign. We could both wait out the matter and leave it to other people, well after our time, to suffer. I might have been willing to accept that earlier, but no longer. For now I have a tool. I am in command. Selden looked steadily at the journalist. What's your tool? He asked, already knowing the answer. You, said Hummond. And because Selden had known what Hummond would say, he wasted no time in being shocked or astonished. He simply shook his head and said, I'm no tool fit to use. Psychohistory is not a practical study. All the space and time of the universe would not suffice to, to work out the necessary problems. Is there nothing to be done? Hummond asked. I can see the empire is falling, but I can't prove it. You could prove the coming fall, or for that matter, 
disprove it. But that is exactly what I cannot do, Selden insisted. Millions of worlds, billions of cultures, quadrillions of people, decillions of interrelationships, and you want me to reduce it to order? No, said Humman. I want you to try for the sake of those millions of worlds, billions of cultures, and quadrillions of people, not for the emperor, not for Demersel, for humanity. I will fail, said Selden. Then we will be no worse off. Will you try? And against his will, and not knowing why, Selden heard himself say, I will try, and the course of his life was set. The journey came to its end. Humman dropped off his air taxi and came back. You're completely safe here from anything outright and open, he said. This is the Streeling sector. They sauntered leisurely along a walkway, which was lit to the extent one might expect of an overcast day. There were people walking in both directions. There were no private vehicles here. He and Humman boarded an expressway coach. Selden stirred uneasily. Where are we going? he asked. Streeling University, replied Humman. Campuses are unbreachable sanctuaries. You'll be safe there, and welcome. It's hard to find a good mathematician these days. You mean, said Selden, it will be a place where I can develop my notions. You have promised, said Humman gravely. I have promised to try, said Selden, and thought to himself that it was like promising to make a rope out of sand. He asked, How long do you suppose I will remain at Streeling University? It would be hard to say, Selden. As I said before, perhaps your whole life, perhaps not. But your life stopped being your own once you gave that paper on psychohistory. Doris Venabili, according to the Encyclopedia Galactica, was an historian born in Cinna who spent two years at Streeling University. Her life might well have continued on its uneventful course were it not for the fact that she became involved with the young Harry Selden during the period of his life known as the Flight. Harry Selden found himself in a bedroom with one corner serving as a washroom. There was no window, though set in the ceiling was a grilled ventilator that made a steady, sighing noise. Selden looked about a bit ruefully. Humman said, you are safe, but no one is absolutely safe. You will have to be careful. On the whole, you'd be far more secure here than had you returned to Helicon or any other world. I hope so, said Selden drearily. I know so, said Humman, or I would not feel it wise to leave you. Selden looked up sharply. Leave me? You can't do that. You know this world. I don't. You will be with others who know this world, said Humman. Just remember that if anyone can make the time safe, if not for ourselves, then for those who follow after us, it is you. Let that thought be your driving force, Harry Selden. Sleep eluded Selden. He tossed and turned until exhaustion overtook him. When he awoke, the room was still dark. He heard a rapping at the door and scrambled out of bed. Who's there? he asked. A rather gentle woman's voice said, My name is Doris Venabili, and I've come to see Dr. Harry Selden. He scanned the security hollow screen cautiously, saw only the woman, then opened the door sufficiently to allow her to enter. He immediately closed and locked the door behind her. She smiled. I'm sorry, she said, but I assume Cheddar Humman would have told you that I'd be coming for you at nine. Selden felt himself relax. She seemed natural and friendly, and her casual reference to Humman reassured him. He studied her. She was average height for a woman, he judged. Her hair was reddish gold and arranged in short curls about her head. She was quite pleasant to look at. She was slim, well-built, looked rather young. Do I pass inspection, she asked. Selden apologized for staring. I'm sorry, but I'm in a strange place. No, no one, and have no friends. Please, Dr. Selden, count me as a friend. May I call you Harry? Mr. Humman asked me to take care of you. This is how it's going to work. First, we'll go to breakfast at one of the university cafes. 
Then I'll get you a room in one of the domiciles with a window. We can use you. Hammond tells me you're a mathematician. Yes, said Selden. I'm an assistant professor of mathematics at the University of Helicon. We're mainly Trantorian here at the university, she said, but there's a substantial minority of outworlders. She told Harry that she came from Cinna, a small world he had not heard of. As she rose and turned to the door, Selden could not keep himself from saying, Are you a member of the faculty? Doris turned and smiled at him impishly. Don't I look old enough? I got my doctorate two years ago at Cinna, and I've been here ever since. In two weeks, I'll be 30. Sorry, said Harry, smiling, but you can't expect to look 24 and not raise doubts as to your academic status. Aren't you nice, said Doris. Selden felt a certain pleasure wash over him. After all, he thought, you can't exchange pleasantries with an attractive woman and feel entirely like a stranger. Breakfast was by no means bad. There was something that was unmistakably eggy, and the breakfast rolls were good. Cheddar told me you were developing something important called psychohistory, said Doris, but I don't know what that is. Harry answered, I scarcely do myself. They talked a bit about their disciplines. She was an historian. Royal Trantorian history was her specialty, and she hoped one day to make book films. Selden felt embarrassed. He knew little outside of mathematics, and he confided this to Doris. I need to study history, he said. Will I be able to use the history library? I give a course on library use, she said. Would you feel it beneath your dignity to sit in on it? It starts in three weeks. You could give me private lessons. Selden felt a little surprised at the suggestive tone that had entered his voice. She did not miss it. I dare say I could, but I think you'd be better off with more formal instruction. It was clear to Selden that he was beginning to like this young woman, and that he was gladly seizing on the chance to be educated by her. He was also aware that he had reached a turning point in his mind. He was determined now to seize psychohistory by the throat, if he had to, in order to make it practical. That perhaps was the influence of Doris Venobili, or had Hummond counted on that? Hummond, Selden decided, might well be a most formidable person. Cleon I had finished dinner. He chewed nuts from the handful he had pocketed on leaving the table and said, Demerzel, what happened to that mathematician? I forget his name. Demerzel did not flinch. Sire, I have failed in part. I felt that while he was planning to return to Helicon, there was always the chance of his deciding to remain. So I arranged to have two young alley men place him on his plane that very day. Oddly enough, Selden was able to fight them off. Apparently mathematics and the martial arts are not mutually exclusive. That I did not learn of this earlier was indeed a failure, sire, and I can only crave your pardon. Under Cleon's questioning, Demerzel revealed that Selden had been helped by a passerby and was now at Streeling University, where he was untouchable. However, he said, there may be use out of adversity. While there, Selden might work on his psychohistory. If he is successful, we would find some way of getting him out. The Emperor remained lost in thought for a while. Then he said, And what if someone else plucks him out before we do? Take the mayor of Wai. He still dreams of taking over the Empire. Demerzel said cautiously, It might be argued that rather than have Selden in Wai's hands, we might prefer to have him in no one's hands, to have him cease to exist, sire. To have him killed, you mean, said Cleon, if you wish to put it that way, sire. Harry had been working at the university now for almost six weeks, and he felt that everything he'd done was useless. Over tea, he said, Doors, I've scanned history after history. All the book films concentrate on the same few crucial events. In mathematics, all we know can be found in the computer. In history, that's not so. Historians pick and choose, and every one of them picks and chooses the same thing. But Harry, said Doors, mathematics is an orderly thing of human invention. History is different. It is the unconscious working out of the deeds and thoughts of quadrillions of human beings. Historians must pick and choose. Exactly, said Selden. 
But I must know all of history if I'm to work out the laws of psychohistory. In that case, Harry, you won't ever formulate the laws of psychohistory. That was yesterday. Now, Selden sat in his chair in his library alcove, having spent another day of utter failure, and he could hear Dora's voice saying, In that case, Harry, you won't ever formulate the laws of psychohistory. It was what he had thought to begin with, and if it hadn't been for Hummond's conviction to the contrary, and his odd ability to fire Selden with the blaze of that conviction, he would have continued to think so. And yet, he could not quite let go. Might there not be some way out? He couldn't think of any. Yet the following day found Harry Selden back in the library. For one thing, there was his promise to Hummond. For another, he owed something to himself, too. So he stared at the list of reference book films he had not yet checked through and made frustrated noises. Startled by a tap on the wall, he looked up and found Lee Sung Randa peering at him around the edge of the alcove opening. Are you all right? he asked. Randa, an instructor in psychology, was intensely interested in the source of Harry's frustration. He wanted to know all about psychohistory. It's just an abstract study, said Selden. It has no practical application at all. That is why I'm reading history. But there's too much of it and too little that is told. But Harry, said Randa, you have only been at it for a matter of weeks. You may have to spend a lifetime making one little advance. He then told Harry about much less complicated meteorological projects that had been going on for generations without progress. Selden scoffed at this. Don't make faces, said Rhonda. Each of the twenty-five million worlds has different atmospheric problems. Trantor itself is a bigger puzzle than almost any other world. The domes were first built because of increasingly bad weather. But the weather is worse now than ever. No one can work it out properly. There's a big project here at the university. General Legan has set up an incredible array of instruments upper side, you know, above the domes. Do you mean people climb up out of the domes and into the air above, Selden asked? Yes, said Rhonda. Would you like to see meteorology in action? It's novel. Besides, you may learn something that will help you with your psychohistory. Isn't that possible? Selden smiled weakly. A great many things are possible, and to himself he added, but not practical. Doors seemed amused when Harry told her he was going upper side. I should go up with you, Harry, but I have a heavy schedule tomorrow. You'll probably enjoy yourself, but stay close to the meteorologist. I've heard of people getting lost up there. General Legan had a dark look about him. It was the way his thick eyebrows hunched over his deep-set eyes. He had, as a result, a most unmerry look as he warned Selden that he needed warmer clothes and gave him a sweater. The two men and two women who were going up with Legan and Selden were dressed in bright pattern sweaters. They were taking with them a cart of instruments. The group filed into an elevator that was marked Official Use Only. That's because it goes upper side, said a young woman named Clausia. People aren't supposed to go up there without good reason. The elevator quivered slightly during the long ascent, which reminded Selden of Hummond's forebodings of galactic decay. It stopped with a small shudder, and the wide door slid open rapidly. The temperature dropped at once, and Selden thrust his hands into his pockets and was very glad for the sweater. Now Legan gave him a hat. Outside, it was cloudy, as it had been the time when he was taken across open country to the palace. Well, Dr. Selden, said Legan, that Rhonda fellow told me you're a mathematician. If you have any questions, our intern, Clausia, will help you. Legan turned away, his scowling face looking grim. Then he turned back. If you get cold, too cold, the elevator door is open. You just step in and touch the spot marked University Base. Clausia will show you, if you forget. Legan left, and Selden looked after him feeling the cold wind knife through his sweater. Clausia came up to him, her face slightly reddened by the wind. She said, When it's this cold, you wouldn't dream that vegetation actually grows on these domes, would you? Selden, surprised, looked about. Gray everywhere. I can't believe it, he said. It's true, replied Clausia. People who've seen Trantor from space say that the planet looks green, like a lawn. There are trees, too. 
There's a copse not very far away. I've seen it, though you can't see it from here. On the other side of a dome that's a call for Clausia came out thinly. Selden realized that they had been walking while they'd talked and had moved away from the others. Clausia excused herself and ran off. Could there really be trees upper side? Had Clausia been filling the gullible foreigner with lies for amusement's sake? Without thinking much about it, he moved in the direction of the highest dome on the horizon. He swung his arms as he trudged along in an attempt to make himself warm. His feet were getting cold. The domes were broad rather than high. Finally, he could see the other side of the dome he had climbed. He looked back to make sure he could still see the meteorologists. They were a good way off in a distant valley, but he could see them clearly. He saw no cops, no trees, but there was some moss and a depression that snaked between two domes. If he followed the crease, he might find trees. He looked back, trying to fix landmarks in his mind, but there was just the gentle rise and fall of domes. It made him hesitate, and Dor's warning against getting lost made sense now. Still, it seemed clear to him that the crease was a kind of road. He strode off purposefully, following the rounded crease downward. There was a soft rumbling noise above, but he didn't give it any thought. The moss grew thicker and spread out like a carpet. The crease continued to curve, and there, just above another dome, was a dark smudge against the gray sky, and he knew he had found the trees. But then Selden took note of the rumble he'd heard before. Was it the sound of machinery? Why not? There must be machinery of all kinds hidden under the domes. Maybe it could be heard when all the other sounds of the world city were absent. Except that it did not seem to come from the ground. He looked up at the dreary, featureless sky. Nothing. And then, far off, a small, dark spot. And whatever it was seemed to be moving as though getting its bearings before being obscured by the clouds again. Then, without knowing why, he thought, they're after me. And almost before he could work out a line of action, he had taken one. He ran desperately along the crease toward the trees and hurtled over a low dome. Panting, he found himself facing a tree. The tree was cold. Its bark was rough. It gave no comfort, but it offered cover. Then he saw it again. It was a jet down, a vehicle that could hover and explore planetary terrain. Only the clouds had saved him. The jet down was closer now, nosing about like a blind beast sniffing out its prey. Would it occur to them to search this group of trees? Would they land and send out armed soldiers to beat through the cops? The sky was getting darker. The clouds were getting thicker, or much more likely, night was falling. And it was getting colder, and would get colder still. Selden had a strong impulse to leave the cops and get back to the meteorological station. After all, how would the man Hummond feared so much, Demerzel, know that Selden would, at this particular time, be upper side and ready to be taken? Still, could he take the chance of going into the open? What if Demerzel did know of his presence upper side because an agent of his at the university knew about it? Lisa Miranda had suggested he go upper side. Was it possible that he was a government agent and had somehow alerted Demerzel? Then there was Legan, who had given him the sweater. It was uniformly purple. All the others' sweaters were brightly patterned. Anyone looking down from a height could spot him among the others. And Clausia, had she isolated him from the others so that he could easily be picked up? For that matter, what about Doris Venavoli? She knew he was going up her side. She might have gone with him, but she was conveniently busy. It was a conspiracy. Surely it was a conspiracy. He had convinced himself now, and there was no further thought of leaving the shelter of the trees. Would the jet down never leave? And even as he thought that, it rose into the clouds and faded away. And finally, he stepped out and moved cautiously beyond the copse. It was dusky twilight. Selden looked about. He could just make out his surroundings. Desperate at the prospect of being enveloped in total darkness, he realized he would have to retrace his steps as quickly as possible. He moved up the crease as fast as he might, but in the inky dark, he could not tell what lay in his path. It was growing colder by the minute. On, on, 
There was nothing else to do. Eventually, it seemed to him that he was moving downward. He stopped. If he had topped the dome, he should be able to see the artificial light of the meteorological station. But there was nothing to be seen. Selden moved forward. He continued for at least a half an hour in the dark. Still nothing. He might be nowhere, far removed from any opening into the dome. He called out for help. Nothing. He felt a tiny cold touch sting his face. After a while, another. He was sleeping invisibly in the pitch blackness, and there was no way to find shelter. He huddled down, knowing that however long the night he dared not sleep. He slipped off his shoes and rubbed his icy feet. Quickly he put his shoes back on. He knew he would have to repeat this, as well as rubbing his hands and ears all night long to keep his circulation flowing. But most important was that he must not let himself fall asleep. That would mean certain death. And having carefully thought all this out, his eyes closed, and he nodded off to sleep, with the sleet coming down. It was not quite the end of daylight when Doris Venable sought out Jenner Legan to find out where Selden was. Legan told her Selden hadn't come down with the group. He suggested Doris contact Glausia, but Glausia also said that she had not seen Selden come down, though she was sure he must have. Doris, by now quite unsettled, wanted to go look for him. But I can't take you up there," said Glausia. "I'm just an intern. You'll have to ask Doctor Legan." Doris Venable knew that Legan would not willingly go up her side; he would have to be forced. She rushed to find Rogan Benastra, the university's chief seismologist. Claiming a matter of life and death, she convinced Benastra to take her to the campus seismograph and search its records. 